Uh, my name is Ashwin. Uh, I work for ThoughtWorks as a developer. So I've spent a little about 12 years in the industry. I spent most of my career working on backend Java and .NET applications. But over the last few years, I have worked a lot in front-end JavaScript applications within large enterprises. And it's been a lot of fun working with JavaScript within the enterprise. But at the same time, there are a few lessons that I've learned that I'd like to share with you all. The intent is so that when you take JavaScript into the enterprise, you're more productive within the enterprise. You also reduce risk for an enterprise, and at the same time, enjoy working with JavaScript within the enterprise. So I'm going to be primarily focusing on uh, three things. The first one is expectations within an enterprise when it comes to building software. And then I'm going to go over enterprise planning and the impact of JavaScript when it comes to planning within an enterprise. And then I'm going to talk about certain constraints that are present in large enterprises that can act as barriers at times. So let me start with uh, enterprise expectations. These are things that need to be managed well. If not, the reality ends up in the opposite direction at times. So the first one I want to focus on is there's an expectation within enterprises of modularization. Enterprises, by the nature of their size and their geographical distribution, often run similar businesses in different regions. And there is always high appetite for reuse within an enterprise, an application built in one place they want the same look and feel, similar experience in other regions, so they want to reuse a lot of the code that is being used. Sometimes these things in large enterprises are not use case driven. So if we don't put a thought towards modularization, or we use a bad use case, you can end up with very high cost when it comes to reuse of your code across regions. And this is something that enterprises don't like. At the same time, if you don't have a proper use case for this reuse, you end up over-engineering the concept of modularization. So how do we remediate this? Right? So what we can do is we can try and prepare for this modularization, not overthink it. So you favor building loosely coupled code. Try and build modules in JavaScript. But at the same time, make sure these modules communicate with other modules through events rather than point-to-point -point communication. For example, if you have a mod module that logs in let it raise an event once you're successfully logged in, and people who are interested in that event can then react. That way, this code is much more reusable than coupling your login module to different modules. Try and share your code as widgets rather than as big modules that have functionality. So these widgets can be configurable. Uh, you can have them as reskinable widgets, make them responsive then these widgets can be used in different applications within an enterprise. At the same time, start by packaging your code. So you can share your code as Bower components. You can share them as node modules. Use a package manager, such as you know, NPM. We heard a lot about NPM today. Uh, at the same time, within enterprises, if you see, it's very difficult to create a module and then upload it onto the internet into a public repository. This is something that enterprises wouldn't allow. And in this case, it's important that if you want to do Node or Bower, you have an internal module repository. So you can use a tool such as Artifactory. And Artifactory supports Bower and NPM. So you can upload your models, your modules to a private repository within an enterprise. So factor this very early. Uh, the next thing I'll focus on is non-functional requirements. Right? So within an enterprise, we often underestimate these non-functional requirements. There are quite a few of them, and primarily around custom analytics. Many enterprises do not allow their data to be sent out over the internet, so your access to analytic tools that are available is less. More often than never, they have solutions for this different solutions, you know, paid solutions running in different parts of the world. So they would like you to integrate with these solutions. Authentication and authorization, again, they have third-party software that does it for them. We need to integrate with this. There is always a requirement for a lot of auditing within an enterprise. So if we don't deal with this early, you often find that we grossly underestimate the amount of work involved in non-functional requirements. And what we build is sometimes not reusable across regions. 
So a few suggestions to remediate this is try and build your non-functional requirements in a non-invasive fashion in JavaScript. So you can use similar server-side concepts that you have in Java or .NET. You can do aspect-oriented programming within JavaScript as well. And what this tends to do is it, it decouples a lot of these non-functional requirements from your functional code, hence making it easier to change. And it doesn't pollute your main business functionality, right? Because these are horizontal concerns. There are many AOP frameworks uh, available. I have worked with Angular AOP primarily. There is Meld and AspectJS as well. Some of these frameworks also support promises. So you, you, you have a handle to send out data once a promise has been resolved or rejected. Right? So they have support for it. So try not to build your own. Use some of these frameworks. And lastly, unit test your non-functional requirements, because these are very hard to debug, because they are instrumented around your code. Uh, the next expectation within enterprises is often metrics and documentation. So enterprises, large enterprises often have a lot of vendors that build things for them, and they experience vendor churn. So there is always a risk of losing knowledge, right? which is why there is a lot of emphasis on documentation. Sometimes enterprises like to own or transfer their ownership to themselves once they feel they're ready to take over the code. At that point, they look out for documentation. And there are always KPIs linked towards quality of what is being generated. And it's important that we build the same kind of quality metrics into our JavaScript code that we use for our backend server-side code as well. So if we don't deal with this early, it could result in a lot of risk to an enterprise and a lot of cost as well, because the knowledge transfer doesn't happen in an effective way. So there is an expectation for documentation. If we don't have metrics or tools that can give us metrics on the kind of quality of the code we are writing, you would end up with poor quality. And the most boring thing that you'll find is having to write a lot of documentation towards the fag end, right? when a lot of context is lost. So how do we remediate this? Start right at the beginning. Do not allow this to pile up towards the end. Be aware that this is an expectation within enterprises. Choose a JavaScript analysis tool, such as, say, Plato or Sonar or ESLint, and set good thresholds for your code quality. So a lot of these tools are able to analyze your cyclomatic complexity, duplication, and structure of your code, and you know, the cleanliness of your code. They give you very good metrics. Another important thing is, within enterprises, there's always a demand to have a holistic view of your software quality. right? So they have tools that generate quality reports for their backend software. They do not want reports for a front end to be separated out from the back end. So see, always within an enterprise, go find out what is the current tools that are being used for analysis. See if you can integrate your front end reports with that so you get a holistic picture of quality. You could JS doc, have comments that document your code. Or even more fun is if you can build live documentation that stays current with uh, the code that you write. So there are runtimes that allow you to inspect them, and you can generate documentation. The next part I'm going to focus on is enterprise planning. Many enterprises budget once a year. They budget for an entire year, and they plan for a year's worth of work. And these promises are then made by the business to their customers. And once that is done, you will find that functional delivery often takes, assumes priority. JavaScript world is a lot of fun, but there's also a lot of churn. And this churn could result in frequent rewrites. And this is often unanticipated when it comes to a year-long worth of work. Right? And just to pursue that year-long worth of work, if we don't stay on the upgrade path, this is going to increase the cost and risk of delaying this. Oops, sorry. So how do we remediate this situation? Right. So. It will be good if we can prepare for this churn, you know, uh, and then protect yourself from the churn and uh, create a JavaScript tech radar within the enterprise. So I'll talk a bit about preparing for this churn. So often front-end code has been mainly for validation purposes, but things have changed, right? We are now using frameworks such as Angular or Ember 
wherein you can have a lot of logic sitting within the front end. Now, I think a lot of the programming principles that apply to back end code apply to your front end software as well. So within your MVC framework as well, you can layer your code into controllers that manage your UI. And then you can have layers of code, such as facades, that you know, delegate to a service layer, which then talk to your backend. Now, if you do not want to couple yourself to a framework, try and keep your facade services, et cetera, in plain old JavaScript, because then it makes it easier to change, because only your controllers then are coupled to a framework that's undergoing the churn. Also, try and use dependency injection for whatever objects that you build, uh, things like ECMAScript 6 modules or require.js, system.js. These help you inject dependencies and makes it much more easy to unit test your code. Right? And swapping out dependencies becomes easier. Once you're prepared, protect yourself as well from this churn. So favor high unit test coverage. At the same time, try and make sure that your unit tests are not coupled to the framework that's undergoing churn. Because these are your safety net. And if they break when the framework changes, then you do not have anything to verify that your code is still doing what it was supposed to do. Right? So, and then have high functional test coverage as well. These often don't tend to make assumptions of the underlying tech that's being used. So when you change a framework, these tests hopefully shouldn't change. And they can be your safety net. Lastly, to work well with the business, make sure that you factor the upgrades for the software choices that you've made into the plan and plan your work accordingly. Make sure you include your tests and documentation, because these two might change because of the churn. We often tend to miss these out. Create a JS tech radar. Uh, what does this radar do? This radar would help you standardize within the enterprise what frameworks you want to adopt. Right? By adopt, what I mean is these are things that have worked well with an enterprise, have been very productive within an enterprise, so you continue to use it within the enterprise. Trial is somewhere where you have projects that can absorb a bit of risk. You believe something will work, and you can try it out. Then SS is where you're actually just spiking out with this piece of software and trying to find out whether this is going to help within an enterprise. Hold is a recommendation that you're making to stop using something within an enterprise. Right? So this helps in bringing about some consistency in the choice of frameworks, because the, we are spoiled by choice in the JavaScript world. Periodically, try and refine this radar so that it stays current. This can be curated by a group of key people within the enterprise. Lastly, uh, focus on enterprise constraints. So the first constraint is the browser ecosystem. Now, enterprises always want their software to be supported on all versions of available browsers. Read IE6, not anymore, but I've been in those situations, right? And unfortunately, some of these browsers are not even available within the enterprise. So enterprises have a way of you know, installing software, and it's very hard to get the kind of version that you want. And based on this browser choice, the choice of frameworks that you use might end up with need for polyfilling, which we know is not very performant in browsers such as IE. Now, this could result in high maintenance and low performance. One of the ways to remediate this is you could use analytics from applications that have already been built in the enterprise to know what is the browser set that your customers are currently using. Use this to drive your technical choices and make choices where you can avoid polyfilling. Set up a process for installing these supported browsers so that you can deliver in an agile fashion and you don't have to delay your testing to the fag end. Lastly, uh, I'd focus on a, a constraint, which is enterprises have a lockdown environment when it comes to internet access. Right? So it's often very difficult to just get into an enterprise and do an NPM install, and it will not work. Right? So there is always limited internet access within an enterprise. There are lengthy software approval processes for installing any piece of software. This becomes a barrier to using open source and also results in a lot of loss of productivity. So remediation is prepare for open source. As I said earlier, provision an internal package repository, such as Artifactory, which can get you your Bower and NPM modules. Request for read-only access to GitHub so that you can install things from the internet. 
And also a software and internet access, because for open source to be successful, you need good forum support. I'll finish by talking about uh, the last constraint, which is compliance and security. With front-end JavaScript applications, some part of your enterprise data now begins to reside in the browser. Uh, they reside in browser caches. They could reside on the disk of the user. Now, if this is not secure, then it could result in a regulatory violation for enterprises, which can bring a lot of risk, financial risk, and reputational risk to an enterprise. So you can remediate this by setting up a certification and approval process right at the beginning. Make sure that you have competent people or bodies to certify that whatever data you're going to be storing now in the front end is secure and it is compliant with the policies that govern the enterprise. And also put in a license approval process to make sure that the enterprise is safe from the kind of software that you're using. We often minify our JavaScript code. Uh, there are options to include the licenses and not have them removed from the software. So just be aware about this. So this is all I had to share with you folks. Thank you.